Do you know that in the United States, there are places built by non-human beings? And here to talk about those places is the man who's been on the trail for years and years, L.A. Marzulli. You have explored places that you believe were built by non-human beings. Now let's explain ourselves and uh, explain your last few uh, DVDs. Well, you know, we're on the trail of a Nephilim, and of course the Nephilim are the unholy offspring between the sons of God, the fallen angels, and the women of earth. And the premise is, if the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, are there vestiges, are there remains of their handiwork? Yes. And that brings us to the mysterious mound builders that go these from Ohio down to the Gulf of Mexico. Some of these mounds are 500,000 tons of earth. There are mathematical mysteries embedded, mathematical codes, um, advanced trigonometry in these mounds, advanced surveying techniques, um, building techniques, they're all there. And many of these sites you can really only appreciate when you're high above in the air. So it is absolutely, in my opinion, enigmatic. And the evidence that we discover in the Mound Builders, the first film, and Mathematical Mysteries, where we prove that you know this octagon mound, which is, ab you can fit the Great Pyramid of Egypt inside the octagon mound. That's how big it is. And when I've, I've been in it several times. And you look around and you go, I don't know what this is. I mean, I know it's an octagon, but, but sit, standing there, I really don't know what I'm looking at. But when you're in the air, a couple hundred feet, yes. it comes into view. Who is the prince of the power of the air? In fact, our mission statement is to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and to herald the return of the king, Jesus. And that's, that's why we're doing this, because it's hidden in plain sight. You know, there's a war going on today uh, between people who want to keep all this a secret sure. and, and people like L.A. who want to expose it, because why? Because it reflects the narrative of Scripture. That is, uh, Scripture describes uh, these builders, if you will, uh, of, of ancient days who were empowered by Satan. They were evil, evil people. And their regimes, though huge, came crashing down uh, through the judgment of God. And, and people today want to wipe out every last trace of the supernatural uh, so that they can keep people from exploring that, that uh, uh, idea and possibly exploring it to the point that, hey, they believe. Which is, by the way, Satan and the world system does not want to happen. And you're out there searching and, and laying this stuff wide open so that people can see, yes, there was an evil supernatural. There was a real Christ who came at a particular time mm -hmm. to save the world. And uh, the whole thing is real. It's not a figment of somebody's imagination. The supernatural uh, thread in our Bibles, the virgin birth, the talking donkeys, the floating axe heads, right. men that walk on water, water that's changing the wine, um, word of it stands up as a heap, staff that turn into snakes. I mean, when we read this stuff, and, and most of us do every Sunday and sometimes, you know, devotionals, whatever, during, during the week, but we are looking at the fingerprints of the supernatural in our Bibles. And that's why sometimes I call it the guidebook of a supernatural, because in my opinion, that's what it really is. Bible means book. It's a guidebook to the supernatural. It tells us what the, who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So do we really believe in those supernatural um, dynamics that I just mentioned? And how does it tie into uh, our quest to find the Nephilim? And this is what I find absolutely fascinating. And having uh, watched your DVDs and talked with, with you, of course, uh, over the course of years, uh, mathematical Mysteries of the Mound Builders, uh, the Mysterious Mound Builders, L.A., uh, I think demonstrates without a single doubt that primitives could not have built those mounds. It took technology of some, some sort, and we don't even know what technology, and to build, build at that scale, that huge scale, requires, well, today it would require caterpillar tractors mm -hmm. and, and earth movers mm -hmm. and all kinds of things, 
which of course they didn't have. And surveying techniques. Ah, yes, that too. How do you how do you lay out the octagon mound, which is absolutely humongous? How do you lay that thing out and and make make each each line, each leg of the octagon perfect? How would you do that? And then the correlation between the octagon mount and the great circle mount. There's advanced mathematics embedded in these mounds. And quite frankly, with all due respect to First Nation people, Native Americans, they did not have advanced trigonometry. And that's what's, that's what's in these mounds. Nor did they have uh, the instrumentation necessary to make uh, observations in the heavens, mm -hmm. to chart the course of the sun, moon, and stars, and then align all their structures on Earth with, with those heavenly bodies. I want to address that really quickly because this is in some way, the essence of the entire case. Many of these, these sites are built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. But that's, you know, and people just throw that out. Well, they, these sites are based on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. But it begs the question, how do they know? Let's go back three or 4,000 years ago and we arrive at a site and we look at the moon and we go, well, we know when it, you know, it, it, it rises and then it sets and it waxes and wanes and does all this, and it's different every night. Yes. But how would you know, if you were going to chart this, where you are in the 18 and a half year lunar cycle? You wouldn't. So let's say you you're start charting in, in year four, but you didn't even know it's year four, but you're charting in year four, and you're looking at the, you know, the rising and setting, the whole deal, and it's different every night. How would you chart that? How would you record that? And then what happens when you get two weeks of, of rain and, and thunderstorms where you don't see the moon at all? You have to start all over again. This was handed to people, to humans, I believe, in the Book of Enoch, which is not part of our Bibles, I get that. But found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's uh, quoted at least 70 times in the Tanakh, tells us specifically that fallen angels gave this information to mankind. That's why these things are built on 18 and a half year lunar cycles. And so here we have episode one and two uh, and detailing the things that Ellie is talking about right now. Uh, but I want to move to episode three. That's, having, the, having that's the latest. Laid right. that groundwork on the trail of the Nephilim, voices from the other side, secrets of the supernatural. Um, this raises a question I think that we have to handle very carefully so that we won't be misunderstood. Uh, you go to a location, a, a mound, or uh, a, a massive uh, terrain moving situation like you find the, uh, in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you've discussed these things for years without going into the possibility that they may be, and I don't know which word to use, but inhabited seems like a, a good neutral word by, if you will, the spirits of those who lay claim to those structures. And now this raises a question that I think we have to deal with carefully, and yet we need to deal with it. Mm -hmm. These sites are highly charged sites. And what I mean by that, if they are Nephilim sites, then blood sacrifice was used there. We interviewed, right. we didn't, well, actually we didn't interview Henry Groover, but Henry Groover appears in the film courtesy Steve Quayle. And Henry's talking about where he goes to the Great Serpent Mound. And we talk about the Serpent Mound in both films. And again, this is the largest snake effigy, serpent effigy on the planet. It's near Peebles, Ohio. And he goes there to, to kind of shut the gate, to, to, to shut this thing down. Got to interrupt you right there. Okay. Because you're talking about a serpent, Serpent Mound. Everybody knows what the serpent is. I mean, if you've read two pages of the Bible, you know what the, ser the old serpent, that's what he's called, Satan. And... <clears throat> He is the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2, 2, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that he is present, if you will, omnipresent around planet Earth, that he's kind of surveying his property all the time. He has a certain amount of power left. He has followers, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness who accompany him. And it just makes sense if somebody built a... Uh, or paid homage mm -hmm. to him by building something called Serpent Mount, that he would be there in spirit. Absolutely, and that's what you're you're talking. I, about. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely. And what what's amazing about when you're at the Serpent Mound, I've been there three different times, and you're looking at this, you're not really sure what it is. They built a three, a two, three story observation tower. You climb to the top of that. Oh, there's, and you can see the undulations. But when it really comes into view is when you fly the drone a couple hundred feet over, 
And, and here's this unrelating serpent. And by the way, the unrelations point to solstices, equinoxes, that whole deal. Henry Gruber is there. Henry Gruber is a controversial figure in Christendom. Some people think that, that what he was doing was off the wall. Other people, like myself, believe in what he was doing. He was take, taking back the land. So Henry's there, and he's, and he's praying and, 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 and canceling any assignments that, have, that were done there, any rituals that were done there. And as he's walking back, it's, it's snowing. There's about four to six inches of snow on the ground. It's late. There's nobody there at all. All of a sudden, he's hit with something visceral, comes at him, knocks him down in the solar plexus. He doubles over, falls into the snow. His knees are up in his chest. This is visceral. He can't move. And he's flailing around in the snow and he realizes he's going to freeze to death. That they're going to find him frozen on the ground. And he begins to pray and the Lord speaks to him and says, I didn't call you in to do this. So this is a word of warning. And then the Lord releases him. Henry gets back in, into the van in, in and, words, and leaves. The Lord informed him that, uh, hey, you're doing this on your own, Henry. And uh, I didn't call you for I, this particular I didn't site. Call you to do this is fascinating to me. Now, let's talk about Henry a minute. I, I've never met the man. You uh, you you speak about him authoritatively and present uh, this episode in a very dramatic way. But let's talk about the man. He is a prayer warrior. I guess we would call absolutely. Him. And he feels led to, if you will, cleanse uh, th- these various uh, places that are were at one point devoted to idolatry. And so he goes there on a snowy night, of all things. He, he, he really feels compelled to do this thing. And, and he has an experience that suggests that, yes, this is spot on. There really is a spiritual life uh, of some sort that's located at that, uh, at that idol. If, let's call mm-hmm. it an idol. It's, mm-hmm. it's huge. But it is idolatry. Absolutely. There was an altar at one point in, in the mouth of the serpent and also a pillar. The pillar, you can see it, it's down below. This whole serpent edifice is on an outcropping of rock. And so down below, the pillar is still there. And one of the things that we want to do is r- kind of get the pillar and see if there's writing on it. No one's ever done that. We want to check it out. But what's interesting is, is the, and we show this in the film, the Mayan elders in 2011, this is the whole 2012 thing. And again, we're, we're, not, we're not believing in the Mayan calendar or the end of the world. In fact, I wrote against that strenuously and, and warning people that this was you know, a ruse, that nothing's going to happen in 2012. But the Mayan elders show up in 2011 at the Great Serpent Mound with the 13 crystal skulls. In other words, they know what these sites are, and that's why they're there. Now, they I've, know. I've seen uh, the DVD, and these people were dressed up in colorful... Full regalia, the whole deal. The, the, I guess priestly costume, yes. uh, as they see fit, to, as they see appropriate. And you, you're talking about crystal skulls here. Tell the people what the crystal skulls are, because a lot of people may not know. There are 13 crystal skulls. It's controversial. Some people believe that they're modern forgeries. Other, others believe, as the Mayan elders do, that these were done by off-world entities. They are made of crystal. There's 13 of them. The Mayan elders brought them to the site, and they performed rituals at these sites. The whole place, the Great Circle Mound and the Serpent Mound, when they were doing the rituals, and we show a little clip of it in the film, when they're chanting, and we only, you can probably hear it for maybe seven or eight seconds. And even with that seven or eight seconds, you can start to feel, and I know a lot of people will go, LA or Willow Woo Woo. No, I'm not. They're, they're opening gateways, which is what these places were. They're opening the gateways, opening the portals to allow the fallen ones back in. Now, we didn't see that on the six o'clock news. No, you're not. But we, we, we can see it here. And, and by the way, it's mind-boggling that a group of people would trek uh, all the way up here, all the way from to per- do that from Peru. And how would they know that? Yeah, how would they know? And they specifically targeted that site. And they're bringing their little crystal skulls, and they apparently have something to say, some ritual to recite. They, they, yeah, they're they're opening up the gateway. They know it's a gateway uh, for the serpent, the Kundalini serpent power. They know it. I mean, they, they, I've actually spoken to Hunbat's men via email. He's, he's passed away now. Mm-hmm. But I was communicating with him after reading his book. And when you get to the very end of his book, what he's talking about is what Hindus talk about, the Kundalini serpent power, 
rising up. And that's what he embraced, which of course is, in my opinion, antithetical to what we as Christians believe. This is, I don't want the, the Kundalini serpent spirit anywhere near me. I want the spirit of a living God coming on top of me. That's what I want. Which brings, coming up, into me. Which brings up the reason we're sitting here today, which is we want you to know that this is real. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is real. His appearance on planet Earth for 33 years was real. He was a real man doing real things and he was the real son of God, born of a virgin. Everything is absolutely true. Uh, we believe this not as something supernatural, but as an actuality. An actuality. The, the one who created the heavens and the earth uh, gave birth to a son, the Lord Jesus Christ, mm. whose mission here was to defeat the very thing that you're describing about the serpent power. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that Crush the head of the serpent. Exactly. And that takes us all the way back to Genesis. The serpent versus the, the son of man. And L.A., there it is in Peebles, Ohio. What, who could imagine such who a thing? Who could imagine? Wow. It, unbelievable. And when we went to these sites, uh, one, one, in, one site in particular, and I, I need to give a word of caution here. Um, we were with Fritz Zimmerman, and we went to this place called Geller Hill. Geller Hill, the Great Circle Mound, and the Octagon Mound create and, and form a perfect isosceles triangle. And surveying, how was that done 3,000 years ago? So you've got all these problems and the mathematics and everything else. The angles are absolutely precise. This was laid out deliberately. So we go to Geller Hill. Geller Hill was a high place. It's the highest place in the county. And allegedly it was the place of the giants were buried in this hill. Well, Fritz had invited this Nork Paranormal Group to come with us because they contacted Fritz and they wanted to tag along. Now, I have no idea who these people are what these people actually do. I've, I've watched like, you know, Ghostbusters on, on TV, maybe 30 seconds of a show in one click. So I, I don't know what they're doing. So it's raining that day. I can't fly with a drone, light mist, can't, can't film, but there's a forest that's right next to Geller Hill. So we go into Geller Hill and this woman, uh, Ray Lynn, takes out this little machine, this little box. And it's called an ovulus. And I have never seen one before. I have no idea what this thing does. And she turns it on. Well, we'll try to get a picture of the ovulus okay. just, uh, right now so that people can kind of get an idea. It's an electronic device. A little electronic device. She switches it on and she waits about 30 seconds. And we're just kind of milling up there. And, and I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, don't, I have no idea what this machine is. I've never seen one before. And all of a sudden, the machine speaks and it says, evil. And I kind of go, whoa, that's, that's really weird. What, what's going on here? Well, we start to walk down into the forest. We walk about 50, 50 feet, and she pauses, and it spits out another word, which, on film, and in the film, I do this. Live on film, when we recorded this thing, I, I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know what this is, and I can't do this. And I say this while the cameras are rolling. I can't do this. And I take authority over it. As a believer, I have the authority, not my own authority, but the authority that I have in, in Jesus, my Messiah, our Messiah. And I begin to pray and I cancel the assignment of the entity which is manifesting through this machine. Folks, this is modern day necromancy. We are literally forbidden to do this. And in no way, I want to make it really clear here, in no way are we endorsing the use of these machines. But I, didn't, I was ignorant. I didn't know what the machine was until the second time. And by the way, the ovulus has 5,000 words embedded in it. So what happens is this device enables these fallen entities, the demonic, to manifest through them, through the electronics. So I pray and I tell her to turn off the machine. She turns it off. She flicks it back on again. And we wait about 20 seconds. And all of a sudden the word holy comes up on the machine. And she, her face just lit, you know, lights up. She's never seen anything like this before. And it was unprecedented for them. So we shut it down. We shut it down and, and the word that came up was holy. And they asked me to leave the area, which I did. And then for the next hour, they tried to get something to work. Nothing would work. So greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And that's what the film is about, to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and herald the return of the king. And Jesus. there are a lot of ghost hunters around today who are you know, walking into cemeteries and places. And they don't know what they're tapping Houses into. of the dead or whatever, but places that are rumored to be haunted and they're going in there. 
uh, listening for maybe a voice, a spirit voice. Now, uh, spirit voice searching goes way, way back to the 19th century. Uh, it comes up electronically through through Nikola Tesla, who actually claimed to have heard "quote unquote" spirit voices in his early radio mm -hmm. gear, and he was very superstitious. and and, uh, and that was kind of a sad chapter in human history. He was a great man, a great inventor, a mathematician, but he somehow accidentally tapped into this stuff. Didn't know what it was, and but you do know what it, what it is, and I think uh, the value of this particular episode, Voices from the Other Side, Secrets of the Supernatural, is to show this is nothing to play with. It, the dark side is real, and we as Christians uh, can clearly see what it is we are appointed to do. And what's amazing about the film, if I may say so, is modern day archeologists, because of their Darwinian paradigm that they adhere to, uh, never look at this, never delve into this. We did. And again, based on the premise that if these are Nephilim sites, then we're going to see evidence of that. There's a pastor, Pastor Tom um, Olson, who comes on the record and he was in Newark, Ohio. And many of his parishioners were, had houses that were built on smaller mounds, okay? Mm -hmm. And he's, when, he, when, he took the, when he applied for the job, um, the, the team of elders asked him, uh, do you do deliverance? And he said, well, no, I, I have no idea what that is. So he gets a call and he goes to this house and people are seeing what can only be described as ghost wolves outside the house that shouldn't be there. Hmm. Another home, they would open up the door to the crawl space. Sometimes it would be a crawl space. Other times they would open the door, there would be a bottomless pit. Now this is a pastor who's not trained in this at all, and he's, he's not sure what to do with this. You sort of open a basement door or a cellar and door? It, and opening a door, and it was a bottomless pit. They would throw stuff down and never hear it hit the bottom. And then like two days later, they come back, open the door again, no bottomless pit, it's a crawl space. Moral to this story is do not build your house on, you know, a, mountain. on a mountain. Exactly. <laughs> um, one of the most chilling moments for him is when he walked into a house again, it was all sorts of stuff going on, the table is levitating. So the reason why we do the film is to, folks, this is happening right here under our noses in the United States of America. And you're not going to hear this in church with all due respect, but we should be hearing about it in church. And there's a conspiracy to cover it all up. Absolutely. Now this is uh, something worth hearing about. No hocus pocus. No superstition. No, I think it's this way and I think it's that way. You've just gone in, you've made the observations, and you're kind of on a learning curve yourself, right? Absolutely, yeah. This, I think, probably taught you a few things. It, it certainly did. <laughs> uh, you know, first of all, you don't go into a place like this unless the Lord calls you to it and you're prayed up. I mean, you certainly don't try to, you know, do anything like Henry Groover did unless you're prayed up. And unless the Lord calls you to do that. We were there filming because we're on the trail of a Nephilim and what we encountered took us all by surprise. And here it is on the trail of the Nephilim, voices from the other side, secrets of the supernatural. Uh, if you need convincing that the dark side is a reality, uh, this will do it. If you don't, <laughs> It's an adventure. And by the way, uh, we're offering uh, you this for $25, uh, free shipping anywhere in the United States. Go to uh, prophecywatchers.tv, uh, click on the online bookstore, scroll down and you'll find uh, this offer. Uh, by the way, uh, we have Mathematical Mysteries of the Mound Builders and the Mysterious Mound Builders, uh, plus three bonus Studio 2 DVDs that we'll put together in a package for you for a gift of $75, free shipping anywhere in the U.S. And by the way, I should mention uh, that uh, L.A. is going to be with us on Watchers Weekend, October 10th through 13th in Norman, Oklahoma. And I have an idea what you'll be speaking about, but I should say, who knows? By that time, you may have uncovered something entirely new. We, we've got some information and I will, I mean, I can't let it out here now, but I will let it out, sort of tease of what we discovered. Uh, we spent 28 days filming in, 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 in Europe at all sorts of different places yeah. and what we discovered there was mind blowing. In fact, folks, a lot of people think that Christianity is 
kind of an innocuous practice. You know, we get together on Sunday, we praise the Lord, and we sing hymns. And so, but we're in a spiritual battle. I've just, I have Absolutely. to say it. L.A. is out there on the front lines. He comes back and he gives us a report from the front lines every now and then. But it's a real battle, right? It's an absolutely it's a real battle, and it's and it's in your face. And all one needs to do is is go to some of these places, and you know, for the most part, you can walk in and and you know, little tourist thing, get your map and, and look around. And nothing's going to happen. On the other hand, what we experienced and what other people came come you know who come on the record in the film. And, and tell us about their experiences and what, what's in these mouths. These are highly charged sites. I can't stress that enough. All of these sites are highly charged sites with the blood of human beings. Ritual human sacrifice. And we all know who the author of that is. You know, I think we, we all assume from having read National Geographic magazine, and we've seen for years we've seen uh, the old pyramids uh, in South America and Central America. And we've read about what the Incan uh, priests did, the Aztec priests, and how they, they slaughtered people by the thousands, mm -hmm. you know, for the uh, sacrifice, their, their still beating hearts and blood on the altar. And, and guess what? Their god was a serpent god. Well, what kind of a Quetzalcoatl? What, what, what kind of a coincidence is yeah. that? It's not a, Gary, it's not a coincidence, and that's why we're on the trail of the Nephilim, because these sites are global, they're worldwide, they're not only in Europe, they're over here, and some of the sites match. In other words, when and we film this, I'm standing in front of this very large mound, and I look at the camera and go, am I in Ohio or someplace else? Yeah. And at this point, I was actually in the UK. Wow. You know, it's uh, it's fascinating, and I, I really am uh, glad that we have somebody like L.A. out there on the front lines. I wouldn't do it. Uh, I, I'm not cut out for it. I, I'm the guy that sit, sits in the midst of stacks of books, and I do research, and I write it all down, and so forth. You're the guy who's out there uh, led to these things, and I believe you are led of the Lord. And I think these things are... are uh, to me, or the value of what you're doing, to me is very quite simply to emphasize the reality uh, of something that might otherwise just seem like uh, maybe fiction, maybe somebody says, but it's not really true. Mm -hmm. You go out there and, and test test it to see whether it's we true. We actually or not. dip our toe in the water and and, and then some. As it were. And I still want to know how you build an 80 to 150 foot mound with primitive tools. Yeah, you can't. You There's can't. something else going on. Here. The very fact that this is a physiological impossibility suggests many, many things. And you're still looking. I think they are the fingerprints of the supernatural and they point back to the dragon and his henchmen, his cohorts, their handiwork. Well, keep uh, L.A. in your prayers. Uh, he's going to need him. Where he goes, he can use all the prayer he Amen can, to that. <laughs> <laughs> can get. I'm Gary Stearman. I've enjoyed this conversation Thank and you, hope Gary. you have. I uh, will see you again very soon. I'm Gary Stearman. You keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com. Keep watching, everybody.